Jeff Clements, President of American Promise. Again, welcome to everybody as people are joining the call from all over the country and people on Facebook are watching uh, perhaps all over the world. So welcome to this critical conversation about democracy in America at a perilous time and the opportunities uh, and work ahead in this next Congress. Um, I want to say, first of all, uh, on behalf of the American Promise team, a big thank you to our wonderful co-sponsors, People for the American Way, Public Citizen, and Citizens United, Declaration for American Democracy. Uh, we'll hear from folks from all of those fine organizations doing important work uh, for democracy reform in America. Um, we're going to speak in depth with Congressman Ted Deutsch, who will be joining us in a little bit from Florida, sponsor of the, the leading constitutional amendment in terms of co-sponsors in Congress to get big money uh, under control and empower the voters and the people. Um, the Democracy for All Amendment, as well as other uh, really essential reforms that he'll be leading and talking about with us tonight. And we're going to hear from, as I said, uh, American uh, People for the American Way, President Ben Jealous, um, who has a deep history uh, and leadership uh, for so many areas of uh, American life that are so critical. But I will say more when I introduce uh, Ben in just a few minutes. And then my colleague, Dr. Jessica Hare, Empowerment uh, Director with American Promise, will be interviewing uh, the folks from uh, Public Citizen, President Robert Rob Weissman, um, Adam Smith from End Citizens United, Jana Morgan from uh, the Executive Director of the Declaration for American uh, Democracy, and, um, and then we'll have the Congressman. So thank you for being here. Again, feel free to put your questions in the uh, Q&A and we'll try to uh, work them into the conversation as we go. Uh, if, if we can't get, get to them all, we certainly will try to get them online as well. So let us begin. Let me just first orient us a little bit, and then I want to bring Ben Jealous into the conversation. Um, as I said, I'm Jeff Clements, president of American Promise. We launched in January 2016 with a 10-year game plan to unite Americans across every divide that we are now seeing so much of uh, to do a really big thing, ratify the next amendment to the US Constitution uh, to enable us, that we the people, to make the rules about how money is used in our political system. And uh, once again, affirm that we are a country of equal rights, uh, equal uh, voice to participate in self-government and that we don't allocate power, political power based on wealth in this country. Unfortunately, it's exactly what we are doing. We need a constitutional amendment because the Supreme Court, which has um, kind of opened this uh, reckless experiment in billions of dollars of big money driving most of the conversation and uh, really misinformation in elections um, won't fix the problem. It's going to be up to us. Um, so we have a lot of folks out there on the call. Thanks to all of you. We have a lot of great uh, leaders across uh, America in other networks, organizations on the left and on the right and in the middle. This is something that Americans want done. Um, we consistently see three out of four Americans support a constitutional amendment to enable us to get a handle on the money in, in politics. And uh, it isn't just because it's a good government idea. It's because we can't get good jobs, good communities, good opportunities, good health care uh, without, without that, um, without that constitutional amendment without some of the big, big reforms that it will enable. Uh, that's why you see that support. And now you're seeing a recognition that we actually have to do the big thing. And that's the perhaps the only silver lining in this challenging year of, of really uh, dysfunction and, and discord and division um, is that Americans are ready to do big, big reforms. Um, so. Uh, the constitutional amendment is moving ahead. Alaska recently became the 21st state to formally call for this amendment and uh, resolutions and other for ballot initiatives and the work in Congress in the states is really accelerating. Uh, so 
We are uh, ready to get it done. Uh, the next few years are critical. The work in the states is critical. The work in Congress is critical. We're going to hear from Congressman Deutsch uh, in a little bit, uh, and he's here with us. Thank you, Congressman, for joining us. We're going to pull in Ben Jealous and a few of our allies first, and then be opening the floor to Congressman Deutsch, uh, who will talk about the democracy reform um, in, uh, in the next Congress. So with that, uh, ben, I think you are, there you are behind my participant screen here. I see you there. How are you? I'm good, brother. I'm good. How are you? Good, good. So good to see you. Um, and I want to I say a little bit, most of us on this call and out there know Ben Jealous. Um, he has been a fighter and a leader for the people and democracy and so much. Uh, former president of the NAACP, the youngest in history, I believe, Ben. And uh, and you're, you're still young as the president of People for the American Way. And somehow in between, he has run for governor of Maryland with an exciting uh, people-driven campaign, been engaged in business, uh, done so much, uh, including Democracy Initiative and other unity work around um, why do we do democracy reform? It's so the people will be heard and the issues we all care about can be solved. Um, so Ben, it's such a privilege uh, to you. be with you. And my favorite fact I learned about you when we talked in Maryland when you were running for governor is your father went to Deering High School in Portland, Maine. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> that was a treat because uh, we used to live right nearby and my sister-in-law is still a counselor there. Oh, so. that's funny. Well, yeah, I know you're a, a Colby guy. My favorite. Yeah, you got well, it. Yeah, your memories. Historically, uh, the uh, jealousies have gone to Bowdoin. Uh, well, I'm sorry about that, but uh, <laughs> all right, everybody, let's dive in. I, I know you want to hear from Ben, not old stories of mine. So uh, let me ask you, Ben, um, you could do a lot of things. Uh, you could do virtually anything in America uh, that you set your mind on, and you set your mind on leadership at People for the American Way and big, big reform and democracy efforts right now. Tell us a little bit more about that. Tell us your vision. Tell us where you well, see no, it. Well, no, thank you. I mean, look, you know, for me, this moment of the, that we just hopefully are emerging from, of people questioning whether our republic will survive, you know, those old New England roots aren't irrelevant to. You know, folks in Northern New England celebrate the 4th of July with a certain type of heart. And my father's family, um, well, he descends from more Revolutionary War soldiers than any one person Henry Louis Gates has ever researched for his show, Finding Your Roots. When you grow up in a family like that on one side, on my mom's side, uh, we now know that uh, my mom descends, well, my, my grandmother descends from, my mom's mom descends from Thomas Jefferson's grandmother by her other grandchildren that were her slaves. And so when you grow up in the old, um, in old, families that take this democracy very seriously, that have oral traditions that stretch back to the very beginning on both sides. Um, it is, uh, it hits you in a special way when folks say that they think that the American experiment might be over, that our democracy is in peril, that the Republic may not stand, that we may be headed into a time of dictatorship and strongmen. So personally, it's part of what, what really got me sort of out of the business world and back in, in to the advocacy world in this moment. Now, we at P People4 are laser focused on ensuring that our democracy doesn't just survive, but thrives. Very much focused on getting money out of politics. Very much focused on re re really restoring the full protection of our voting rights. And in this moment in Georgia and also uh, nationally, just, just with these past e elections, very much focused on, frankly, that only antidote to voter suppression in the moment, which is massive voter turnout. And so, you know, as a guy who's just, you know, as you put it, kind of a young but old civil rights guy, uh, you know, uh, the, now the youngest retired civil rights leader, if you will, in the country, uh, as they said when I left the, NA, the NAACP, it was just important to get back on the battlefield. Very proud of the work that we're doing at People4, very proud of our partnership with you to try to get this passed. Yeah, well, and likewise, Ben, and 
you know, I want to pick up on something you you frame this with. It, it really is not an exaggeration, it seems, and I think so many Americans now recognize it to to say that uh, and and see that the real future of the country, even as a what they call the American experiment, you know, of, of self government of equal human beings. Uh, it was an improbable idea. It hasn't been done successfully much in human history, but we set about to do it, and it could, it's all on the line again, as it as it often is. And so we're going to talk about the constitutional amendment um, that is really about political equality as much as campaign finance or money and politics. Fundamentally, it's a question of are we equal rights or did people with more wealth get more power? Um, and or are we equal citizens? So I want to ask you, um, because of your rich history um, in your family, right to you about basically this, um, you know, dark and light side of the American promise, the, the lack of delivery of the American promise and the insistence every generation that we're going to make it real and, and the constitutional amendments, because people hear, oh, constitutional amendment, you don't do that. Somehow we don't do that but you look at what we've done with constitutional amendments in history and almost how irresponsible it would be not to try, not to win it this time. Can you say a little bit about that in, in terms of like why a constitutional amendment as far as you're concerned and why, you know, how do you see the power of the people trying to ratify amendments like that? Well, it's simply the only way to fix the problem. There's a point when you have a problem that's so big that you can't really, um, even propose half measures. You just have to go for the only solution that's gonna work. And this is the only one that will work. And that's why we support it. It doesn't require a constitutional convention. It just requires that we get the states to vote. We get this, you know, the support of the Congress and the Senate and we get it done. And, um, and we have great faith that we can get it done. Uh, the support seems to keep building. We've, uh, you know, now that Trump is out of office, really got to lean into building uh, more support in the Republican Party. But quite frankly, the voters who swept Trump into office, one of their big things was they thought they were draining the swamp. They thought they were getting money out of politics. Uh, and, so, and so there is actually even some hope there, if you will, in the populist appeal in the Republican Party of this point. And hopefully more courageous folks will stand up. I've seen that happen in the criminal justice movement the criminal justice reform movement. You know, I've partnered with Newt Gingrich and Grover Norquist to uh, help Stacey Abrams and Nathan Deal shrink the prison system in Georgia, for instance. Um, you know, and then did turn around and do the same thing uh, in Texas. And, uh, and so I, you know, I do have faith, even in these cynical times and these very partisan times that on an issue like this, we can get support across across party lines and we see a building, we lean in more, we push harder and it will be easier not having uh, Donald Trump as an obstacle. Yeah, and you know, we at American Promise do a lot of cross-partisan work around the country and we've this last several months, a lot in Maine and Alaska and Wyoming, all over the place. And we see exactly th that it doesn't matter um, who Americans voted for in the election in terms of their support for this kind of big reform and the constitutional amendment, it, it transcends the party. And that is, <clears throat> excuse me, that is hopeful about um, being able to unite people to do this, um, recognizing that there's some deep differences. Um, you know, the other thing I, I noted when, I, when we were sort of launching American Promise, I wanna ask you about, sometimes like you said, Ben, the, the bigger the problem, the bigger the solution, you know? And if we look at when do we do constitutional amendments in this country, it's when everything's on the line and falling apart. You know, it's after the revolution, it's after this, in the midst of the civil and after the civil war, it's between 1910 and 1920, a pandemic war, you know, gross inequalities. Um, and then in the 1960s, we did four constitutional amendments, ended the poll tax, you know, some pretty big stuff, 18, 19 years. And yeah, and it's, and it's often around securing our democracy. You know, yeah. I look at my grandmother, who's 104, and uh, when she was born, you know, uh, her mom couldn't vote. Um, you know, I look at my mom, who's 81, and when she was born, the poll tax was very much in effect. And so, um, you know, it just sort of makes sense that, uh, you know, if it was just sort of like two generations ago that, that uh, 
babies were being born in, women couldn't vote, and three, you know, and one generation ago that the poll tax was in effect, that we would have work to do uh, now. And this is definitely a big, a big part of that work. Yeah, well, that's great. We're going to have to end it there and bring in some of the other panelists, but um, we have a lot more uh, to talk about. We hope you'll come back on our calls uh, in the future and Absolutely. we'll certainly look forward to working very closely with you, Ben, and People for the American Way and, and, and so uh, grateful for all your leadership. So thanks for being here with us. I hope you'll stick around. You know, you may need to head out, but if you, uh, we're just really glad you're here. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, Ben. Hey, let's go to Dr. Jessica Hare, our Empowerment <laughs> Director at American Promise. Uh, hello, Dr. Jessica, who's going to take over and interview a few of our allies uh, and, and our leaders at the some of our co-sponsors for this evening. And I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Hi, Dr. Jessica. Hi, thank you, Jeff. Um, so as Jeff said, I'm Dr. Jessica Hare, the Empowerment Director for American Promise. Um, we are very lucky to have many devoted democracy reform advocates across the country watching this webinar and I'm equally lucky, um, lucky to have three organizations committed to empowering and giving voice back to the American people. Um, Public Citizen and Citizens United and Declaration for American Democracy are all at the forefront of efforts to get money out of politics, restoring our voting rights and holding our governments accountable. So my first guest tonight is Rob Weissman. He is the president um, of Public Citizen and an expert on government accountability. So Rob, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. It's great to be with you. Yeah, uh, so my first question, Rob, is um, how have everyday activists played a role in creating the democracy movement we're seeing today? Uh, they've done everything. That's why there is a movement. Uh, almost by definition, of course, what's a movement, but a movement made up of people. But if, even if you want to sort of be highfalutin instead and think about, well, how have things been moving for legislation on Capitol Hill? How has our constitutional amendment been moving on Capitol Hill? Well, it's due 100% to grassroots people coming together and demanding it. Um, it's not so often you get a story that's as clear about the value of grassroots organizing as our story for a constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. You know, when the decision was handed down in, in 2010, there was no interest on Capitol Hill in a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United because people thought, yeah, well, that's a bad decision. Maybe it'll be really bad for the country, but a constitutional amendment, that's not a serious idea. Mm -hmm. And so there was no appetite. In fact, we can measure it. There were two senators, two, who supported a constitutional amendment in that first Congress after the decision was handed down. But then organizing started around the country. People came together uh, in all with all kinds of different organizations, including Public Citizen. I don't think American Promise was around yet, but Jeff was certainly in the struggle from the get-go. And <laughs> demanding that their um, local and local officials and state officials pass resolutions calling for a response for a constitutional amendment, a response to this horrible Citizens United decision. And it started to bubble up. And the Congress after that, we had 26 senators on board for a constitutional amendment. More organizing happened, it got more feverish. People were really empowered and angry because they were seeing what was happening because of the decision. Next Congress, 50, we, got, we want to vote in the US Senate and 54 members of the US Senate voted for a constitutional amendment. An idea that at, at the beginning, it's been seen as totally fringe, right on the merits, but unreasonable, mm -hmm. suddenly be thrust itself to become reasonable. And that was 100% due to people on the ground organizing from the bottom up and demanding it. It wasn't because of clever lobbying, we do clever lobbying, that wasn't what did it. It was all from the bottom up pressure. So um, with that being said, do you believe that, uh, is it realistic that we're going to win? Yep. <laughs> bet it is. Um, and you know, the people who think it's not realistic, well, a lot of my friends said it wasn't realistic and thought it was a terrible idea to support an amendment in, in 2010, because who would go for something so crazy? Well, who would go for is more than half the US Senate in 2014, more than half the US Congress uh, in, in 2019, 21 states now, including just newly Alaska, joining us with resolutions, state resolutions or the equivalent calling for a constitutional amendment. 
every significant Democratic candidate for president. So the idea is mainstream. We just have to keep building the power to win. I'll tell you what's not reasonable, what's not realistic. What's not realistic is something short of a constitutional amendment. Mm-hmm. because the Supreme Court is not going to rescue us from this. That's clear. There might have been a different pathway, but that's gone now. And we can't live in a country, we can't live in a country where corporations have the right to spend whatever they want to influence election outcomes, where the super rich can spend millions or tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of their own money, dollars, to influence elections, and they steal our democracy from us. We just can't live with that. So what's unrealistic is accepting the status quo. And thinking that, and by the way, and then thinking things are going to get better. Thinking, well, yeah, we can do something on, let's figure out how we can sort of deal with climate change. Let's figure out how we can deal with wealth inequality. Let's figure out how we can deal with the healthcare crisis. Let's figure out how we can deal with drug pricing. We're not going to be able to deal with those things. We're just not. We work on all that stuff, but we're not going to win the big victories in those things until we take on this problem that's imposed upon us by the Supreme Court and the Citizens United decision, and of course, in other decisions like it. Absolutely. Well, Rob, we certainly thank you. And we also thank Public Citizen for all of the inspiring work that you all are doing now currently and that you will do in the future. Um, and, and, you know, again, thank you for being on the call with us tonight. So Thanks I'd like for to, having um, us. And it's great being partners with American Promise and, and with you, Dr. Jessica and Jeff and everybody on the team and everybody out there. Let's dig in. Um, we're going to drive this thing forward and win. And it's the only way we win is if we all pitch in and the alternative is, is not an alternative. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. Um, so I now like to bring into the conversation Jana Morgan, who is the executive director of Declaration for American Democracy. DFAD, as it is known in the, in the business, is a coalition of over 170 groups from labor, racial justice, faith, women's rights, environmental good, envi- um, good government, and many other important communities. So Jana, welcome. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Jessica Hare. Uh, I want to also thank American Promise for hosting this uh, conversation tonight. And I want to thank Congressman Ted Deutsch for his continued leadership uh, in reforming our democracy and especially in leading the fight to overturn the disastrous Citizens United decision. Well, thank you, Jana. Um, so let's dive right into it. One key piece of legislation uh, the incoming Congress will address, um, address is H.R. 1 the For the People Act, DFAD calls H.R. 1 the boldest democracy reform since Watergate. So Jana, can you tell us about H.R. 1 and how it um, insects with DFAD's fight to overturn Citizens United? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks so much. Uh, So, you know, at the very core, we believe that we must have a democracy that responds to the needs and priorities of voters, Mm -hmm. not wealthy donors or corporate interests. And so HR1, the For the People Act, is a bold, comprehensive democracy reform package that will go a long way towards ending the dominance of big money in politics. It'll expand the right to vote and restore ethics and accountability in Washington. And it contains three main pillars. The first is ensuring all Americans can have their voices heard by reforming our voting and election laws through the strengthening of election security, ending partisan gerrymandering, and enacting automatic voter registration, among other reforms. The second pillar is to get big money out of politics, which we're really talking about here tonight, um, by creating a new small donor matching fund system for federal candidates, requiring super PACs and dark money political organizations to make their donors public and strengthening oversight rules to ensure that those who break campaign finance laws are actually held accountable. Mm -hmm. And the third pillar is to hold public and elected officials accountable by expanding conflict of interest laws, banning members of Congress from serving on corporate boards and requiring major party presidential candidates to publicly disclose their tax returns. And of course, to speak to your question, the bill recommends that the Constitution should be amended to overturn the Citizens United decision to allow Congress and the states to set reasonable campaign spending limits that distinguish between people and corporations. Because as we all know, there actually is a difference between people and corporations. 
Um, and just to talk a little bit about that decision, um, the Supreme Court's 2010 Citizens United decision paved the way for corporations and wealthy donors to spend unlimited amounts of money to influence elections and by politicians. And today we are all paying the price. Since that decision, political contributions from wealthy and powerful groups into federal elections have skyrocketed. There has been $7.1 billion of outside spending in federal elections since the Supreme Court ruling. And prior to the Citizens United decision, over 80% of outside spending was fully disclosed. But from 2010 to 2020, just 50% has been. And in an election season that saw a record 14 billion spent on political candidate races, more than double what was spent in 2016, the need for transparency is greater now more than ever. And when our elected officials are beholden to their donors, rather than the people who elected them, we can't make progress on the issues that people care most about, like expanding affordable health care and passing fair labor laws, or curbing climate change and addressing gun violence. And a good example of the outside influence that money has in our political system is that last year, amid a backdrop of soaring prescription drug prices and public outrage, Big Pharma spent more than $228 million to lobby against legislation that would rein in pharmaceutical companies and level the playing field for our citizens. And this is despite the overwhelming public support to reduce the cost of health care. So if we are ever going to truly reduce the power of big money and special interests and see progress on the issues that voters care most about, we must advance HR 1, the For the People Act, restore the Voting Rights Act, and amend the Constitution to overturn Citizens United. And Jessica, I'd love to talk a little bit about how people are making their voices heard to reform mm -hmm. our democracy. So we have some amazing ongoing efforts right now with our grassroots activists and members, and we have some helpful tools so that anyone can be a part of the fight for a functioning democracy. So if you go to dfadcoalition.org or declarationforamericandemocracy.org, you can see our take action page. You can sign up to receive a training on how to talk about these issues with your members of Congress, send an LTE, make a phone call, sign our petition calling for HR1 to be a first priority in the next administration. Or you can go to our resources page and share our videos, graphics, or just learn more about these issues. There are a ton of ways that activists are plugging in. And so we really encourage anyone who is interested to be a part of this incredibly important movement. And our goal is to create a democracy where everyone's voice is heard, everyone participates, and every vote is counted. And to make progress on the issues that Americans care most about and that impact their lives every single day, we must fight the corruption in Washington and transform our democracy so that it is truly for the people. Wow. Well, thank you, Jana. That was very um, empowering and inspiring. And um, I know, you know, we here at America Promise are very proud to be a part of the DFAD coalition. Um, so we thank you so much for that. Um, and now we'll transition. Joining us now, much. yeah, uh, joining us now is Adam Smith. Adam is the Strategic Partnerships Director for In Citizens United which of course is working to reverse the U.S. Supreme Court 2010 Citizens United decision and aims to elect campaign finance reform champions to Congress. So Adam, welcome to the call tonight. Thank you, thanks for having me and I'm excited to be here. Sure, so let's dig in. Yeah. <laughs> so we're talking today about the Democracy for All Amendment. Yep. But there are other major reform bills uh, you all are working on as well. So Adam, can you talk about how this amendment goes hand in hand with legislation like HR1, um, the For the People Act? Sure, and you know, um, Jana did a great job talking about HR1. So I thought I'd talk for a minute because Georgia's on everyone's mind <laughs> and we just got out of an election about how these issues are also tied to voting rights. You know, when we talk about money and politics, what we're talking about is who has power and a voice in our elections. And it's the same thing with voting rights, who has a voice, who can be heard. And so I think that um, when we talk about the reason we need things like a constitutional amendment to get rid of Citizens United is because um, we need to give power back to the people. And once we, the same people that are funding attacks on the 
right to vote. It was the same people behind voter suppression laws and you know these lawsuits that we saw throughout the election are the same people that benefit from this big money system. And so you know it's really important for us to pass laws like HR1 to you know strengthen our voting laws and campaign finance laws to overturn Citizens United and to strengthen and protect the right to vote because it's all about the same fight like who has mm-hmm. power who has a voice and that's why you know we think all of these work together there's no silver bullet for democracy reform you know all of these bills are really important for to sort of achieve this equal democracy that we're all looking for okay all right um so adam uh in Citizens United is uh, one of the only democracy reform groups that works in electoral politics. Um, so why do you think this is an important part of the reform strategy? Sure. You know, I think our name is pretty clear about what our goal is and Citizens United. And um, yeah, you know, I think as Rob and, and Ben and Jenna have said, there's a lot of public support out there for these issues. Everyone agrees with us. There's like no other issue other than like apple pie where more americans agree there's too much money in politics but i think for a long time politicians didn't feel the political pressure to take these issues on so we think one of our key strategies why we were created was because we wanted to one elect people who were reformers and oppose people who would oppose these reforms you know we um we think reform is good policy and good politics so what we spend our time doing is you know going out to help elect candidates who run on reform issues you know who reject corporate PAC money support policies like the democracy for all amendment and the for the people act and we've seen a bunch of people in 2018 for example when, when democrats we took the house get elected on reform people like you know um katie porter who everyone Katie Porter with a whiteboard holding people accountable, you know, Colin Allred in Texas, Abigail Spamberger, you know, Lucy McBath, you know, who is a really good example of why we need to have uh, people from, you know, a lot of different backgrounds in Congress. And once you elect those champions on the mandate of reform, they can then come to Congress, like with HR1 in 2019 and say, I ran on reform, I won on reform, and now we're gonna deliver on that promise. And so we need to keep electing more people like that, both in Congress, up and down the ballot. And honestly, we also need to defeat people who will oppose us, defeat people who won't stand with, you know, their constituents who support these issues. And that's why we think, you know, an electoral component is so important and why, you know, when all the people on this call, when you're, you know, out there, if you're like phone banking or knocking on doors or all of that stuff, whenever you talk to a politician, you have to tell them reform is a key issue for me um, because they need to keep hearing it over and over again Mm -hmm. um, because that's how we're gonna get them to feel like they have to take this on. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you, Adam and and Citizens United for your time and you know for this very informative uh, information that you provided us with. Um, thank you again, Rob Weissman from Public Citizen and Jana Morgan from uh, Declaration for American Democracy for sharing their upcoming legislative priorities and for the inspiring work um, that all three organizations are doing in the uh, democracy reform space. Um, so now I will turn it back over to our president here at America Promise, Jeff, with our feature interview, which is uh, with uh, Congressman Ted Deutsch. So Jeff, back over to you. All right, Dr. Jessica, thanks so much. That was great. And thanks to everybody, uh, Adam and Jenna and Rob, uh, inspiring. And welcome Congressman Ted Deutsch, uh, a great friend of American Promise and of uh, this this great movement for democracy reform. Um, You've been good enough to be at our conference. We've done events with you all over the place. you're, we're so glad to have you here. A leader in Congress, uh, Representative Deutsch is chairman of the House Ethics Committee, a senior member of the House Judiciary Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, he has uh, led uh, the lead sponsor, this Democracy for All Constitutional Amendment um, from the beginning. And uh, my, uh, my friend, uh, uh, Gregory Joseph, our communications director, uh, calls you the pride of Boca Raton, and uh, <laughs> so uh, Congressman uh, is is Florida's twenty second congressional district representative, and uh, 
we look forward to seeing you down there when we're all allowed back out again in good weather. So Congressman, thank you for being here with us. Um, I want to just ask you straight up, uh, you have been so in the lead and pushing this constitutional amendment from the beginning. I know you have a lot of other democracy reform priorities and I hope you'll share them with us tonight, but let's start there. Why a constitutional amendment? Why that big uphill push and, and where do you see it going? Uh, well, I um, it's great to be with you. Thanks very much, Jeff and, uh, and Dr. Jessica and um, really honored to be with Ben Jealous and um, always great to be with, with Rob Weissman and Jana and Adam. And it's, um, you've, you've brought the A team together uh, of, of reformers, people who understand the moment that we're in. And I'm so grateful to be with all the, the members on the call from American Promise um, and all these other groups. This is, it's an amazing coalition of Americans uh, who are all committed to overturning Citizens United. We need to get money out of politics. We've heard all of, a lot of the arguments already. It, it's how we root out corruption. It's how we return power in our political system to the people. And there is a, a moment now because of the changes that are happening in Washington for us to come to meet together to recommit ourselves to restoring our democracy after what was another record-breaking election cycle. And I mean, we haven't really talked about how uh, how terrible this election cycle was in terms of spending, but it makes the point why this is all so important. This was the most expensive election in our history, and we're desperately in need of a constitutional amendment. The 2020 elections cost over $14 billion. That's double the amount spent in the 2016 elections. It's more than the past two presidential elections combined. And yeah, there were more small dollar contributions. That was great but it's still billionaires and dark money groups and super PACs, high dollar funders that overshadow the impact of voters. That's the problem. That's the moment that we're in. And um, I, I go on and on, but that we have an opportunity now to restore our democracy, just as we're coming out of an election where, where restoring our democracy was such a key part of the campaign. This is a natural thing for us to galvanize behind um, right at this moment. Well, it, it sure is. And I, um, you mentioned the $14 billion. I think it's important to say, and I want to ask you about something you've said about the connection of money and, and, and uh, electoral politics. But you know what's, what's interesting about the money is it's not just a lot of money. It's, it's particularly driven into, it seems, a, a, a great deal of misinformation of misleading and the notion that we couldn't regulate money in politics was supposed to be about free speech. And I have a friend in Maine who is uh, um, at the other end of a $200 million Senate race in the Susan Collins race. Um, this was actually an active Republican um, who said uh, about that, it was like being under 20 feet of snow in an avalanche where nobody could hear me and I couldn't hear anybody else. It was just done to them and it tore this, this, the state apart. And I think that happened around the country. Um, so what's your experience as, as somebody who is in that system, running for office, trying to get a serious conversation out and talk to people about what they believe in? Um, I've heard it called, you know, if you spend $14 billion to make Americans angry, fearful, divided, and hyperpartisan, they will be angry, fearful, divided, and hyperpartisan. And what do yeah. you see in, in, in the system from your perspective in that? Uh, yeah, and the reason that they're angry, fearful, and hyperpartisan is because they believe that their elected officials are putting special interests first, putting it above them because of the billions of dollars pumped into the election. Uh, we People don't believe that their leaders are actually representative. They feel like politicians are selected by wealthy campaign voters. Uh, donors rather, not not actually elected by the voters. And and the argument that, that you hear, the outrageous argument that spending money is an exercise of free speech, if that's the case, then the 10 couples who spent over $1.2 billion in the decade since Citizens United, then they've got the same rights as the 6 million Americans who spent $200 each. That's, that's not right. And, and if you think about where that's led, and we, we haven't talked about this, Jeff, but 
we're we're now at the mercy of social media companies to limit the the attempts to go out and buy elections. The fact that that all of this attention is paid on when Google and Facebook are going to and Twitter are going to allow political ads to be run, it shouldn't be the only limit on what gets spent in our campaigns. Uh, when we overturn Citizens United, we'll be in a position to allow reasonable limits on election spending. That's going to protect our elections. It's going to level the playing field for, for so that people from all walks of life can seek a lock, elected office. And it's going to force elected officials to focus on the priorities of everyday people and not these huge donors. Yeah. And let's talk about those priorities because I, I you know, when we talked earlier today, you, you, you said something that really stuck with me, which is, and you've said before, <laughs> That your status in a democracy should not depend on your economic status, and and you know obviously the economy, jobs, um, the the virus situation and the pandemic, those are really important kitchen table issues. People um, are, are right to think um, that they want their Congress to be fixing those problems. What is the connection between? the way money's used in politics, the way the need for this constitutional amendment and actual impact in real people's lives. Well, look, the, the pandemic, unfortunately, has, it's exposed a, a lot of things, but this is, this is one more and it doesn't get talked about enough. Uh, we had a crisis with, with PPE, with, with protective equipment early on. And, uh, and the administration, Jared Kushner started a program to to bring all of this uh, PP, all this equipment into America, but totally um, on his own without accountability, no ability for, for the American people to, to see where everything was going. And it just looked an awful lot like a handful of big companies were making decisions about where everything went. And that was ultimately gonna impact who has the protection they need to do their job and to keep themselves safe while they're doing it. The same thing is true as we look at the fact that we're now a couple of weeks from the end of the year. And we've been talking about COVID relief and the need for more COVID relief and what's gonna happen at the end of the year if we don't pass a bill. We've been talking about it for months. And, and the biggest holdup at the moment is that some of the largest campaign contributors, some of the, the biggest donors are insisting that, that as part of this, as part of this effort to get money out to people who are really struggling, and to our schools and to our state and local governments and to help feed the hungry that they want total immunity from any lawsuits for a matter of years that people look at all of this and, and are right to say, well, how about, how about us? Why aren't you doing everything that you can based on our needs first and foremost? And that, you, so you've, you've seen through the pandemic exactly how damning the, the, the current system is. Yeah. Um, let's look ahead to the Congress. The new Congress is coming in in January. Um, there's a lot of interrelated parts that are, are impacting our democracy um, across many different areas. Money is a big part of it. Um, would you talk a little bit about what your agenda is, democracy reform, and the connection and uh, to the constitutional amendment we're working on, but also the other pieces, how they fit together, how you see them moving ahead? Yeah, I, well, I think that they, I think they all go together. Uh, the fact is, all of our efforts to empower small do, do, small dollar donors, to uh, protect our elections, uh, to ensure uh, an easier uh, time for people uh, registering to vote and casting their vote, uh, all of those things that we're trying to do, uh, ultimately are are going to be easier and. Uh, and it'll be easier to accomplish and it'll be more sustainable if and when we pass the Democracy for All Amendment so that you, you can't have these huge groups, big corporations and a handful of billionaire donors come in and throw the money around to help undercut all of the, to first to try to block our efforts and then to undercut the implementation of them once we, once we pass them. So it's, uh, they all go together. But underlying all of this is money, and it's the massive amounts of money that have poured in since the Citizens United decision that came down just a, a, 
a few weeks before my first election to Congress uh, back in 2010, and it, it cries out for action. And that's why we're doing this. And that's why we've, as Rob walked through all of the, the, the growth in the number of co-sponsors, I was reminded as he talked about the two senators who supported this initially, uh, that Bernie Sanders and I introduced, just to put this in perspective, that some of the folks on the call will appreciate the outlawing corporate cash undermining the people's interest in elections and democracy amendment, which for those of you who weren't following, is the occupied amendment, which puts it very much in that moment. But all of the things that we were worried about have, have unfortunately proved true. And so we need to come together. That's why your work in bringing these groups together uh, is so important. Uh, we need to come together as we have grow this movement around the country where, where this isn't a partisan issue and make Washington understand and make my colleagues in Washington understand that your approach to this, Jeff, which is, uh, which is cross-partisan and bipartisan is the, is the only way to go because everyone, Democrats and Republicans alike, believe that the system is rigged against them. So let's come together and restore it for them. Yeah, that's so, so true. Um, thank you. And um, Congressman, we just have a couple of minutes, but we're going to be asking people at the end of this call to take action. We are talking tonight, but we're also mobilizing. Um, we're asking them to contact your colleagues and their, their representatives to get behind your efforts. Um, what specifically else would you share with us in terms of we have you know thousands of people watching this on Facebook uh, live streams and elsewhere. Um, what can we do most effectively to help you advance this constitutional amendment in Congress? Well, just uh, just be out there and and be engaged with with my colleagues, with your members of Congress. And we're getting ready to to reintroduce the Democracy for All Amendment in the 117th Congress. We have 221 co-sponsors in the House right now. The count restarts in January. Democrats obviously are going to have a slimmer majority in the next Congress than we do now, but we're committed to start strong with the democracy reforms of HR1 and H HJ Res 2, which is the Democracy for All Amendment. So what can the advocates do? Build up support across the country, urge your members to sign on as co-sponsors. Um, you know, we need, as you know, we need two thirds uh, in both chambers to pass a constitutional amendment. Then we need three quarters of the states to ratify it. And while 21 states have passed resolutions supporting an amendment, we're gonna have to work hard to prepare for a total of 38 states to ratify an amendment after it's passed by Congress. So we've got short-term goals on reintroduction. We need co-sponsors, we need help with that. We wanna draw attention to the toxic influence of money in politics through talking to members and our staffs, and we're gonna have hearings, uh, but this is a long-term project. So all of you who are watching, you have a really important role to play with your members of Congress and your senators, with your local elected officials, state reps, state senators. Uh, for this to happen, everyone's gonna have to be on board. So there is no, there, there are no shortage of opportunities to go out, make your voices heard, urge your elected officials to stand with you uh, and uh, to stand up for, for a, a system which recognizes that uh, free speech isn't free if only the wealthy can afford it. And that's what we're gonna move past when we pass the Democracy for All Amendment. Well, thanks. You're, that's so true, Congressman. And we're going to leave it there, but we are going to pass it back to Dr. Jessica Heron in just a minute to be specific about what we can do. American Promise has campaigns and chapters in virtually every state. So uh, there, we're just seeing, we've seen a real shift in the last two years or so, Congressman, um, where now Republicans, independents, Democrats in the states are recognizing this has to be done. And I think we're going to, we're going to see a lot more pressure on, uh, on members of Congress of, of both parties to figure out how to do this together and get that two thirds vote. Congressman, thank you for everything. Thanks for your leadership. Thanks for being here with us uh, tonight. We'll hope we'll see you again soon. Look forward to it. Thanks so much for having me and thanks everyone for all the, the great effort thus far and the hard work that we're all gonna engage in to get this done. Our democracy is counting on you. Yeah, outstanding. Thanks, thanks. Congressman. And thanks. Dr. Jessica, back to you. Yeah. So. Um... Thanks again, um, thanks again, Jeff, for sending it back to me. Thank, uh, thank you again, Congressman Deutsch, for that uh, informative interview. Um, so moving forward, in 2021, um, America Promise, we will definitely unveil new skills training under our National Civic Workshop Programming. 
um, our National Civic Workshop uh, are trainings designed to give grassroots advocates and our supporters the tools that they need to get their states ready to ratify a constitutional amendment ending big money in politics. With our state-based campaign approach, um, America Promise is definitely committed to help build effective, self-sufficient state chapters by offering trainings to forge stronger skills in communications, organizing, empowerment, and so much more. Um, so with the many attendees that we have on this call tonight, uh, if you're interested in helping to build a citizen-led coalition that is needed to pass a constitutional amendment, we encourage you and invite you to please join us for our January National Civic Workshop by visiting our website and joining American Promise. Um, so we hope that this webinar has inspired you all to take action on behalf of the um, democracy reform agenda that, um, that was discussed here tonight. As just interviewed with Congressman Deutsch mentioned, the Democracy for All Amendment has been introduced and our representatives in Washington need to hear about it and add their support to this legislation. Um, so now our call to action to you all, our December call to action is asking you to call your senators and member, uh, member of Congress and tell them that as, as a con constituent and voter, you are alarmed um, that dark money and special interest group have seized our democracy and their support of HR1 and an amendment to the US Constitution is needed in order to strengthen the voice of the American people and usher in a new era of representative democracy. So a personal call or email in your own words to your representative and senator always is the most effective. You can submit these through the websites of your, of your, 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 your representatives and we are dropping a link in the chat section to our handy tool where you can find your member of Congress and send an email to them. We will also follow up with an email tomorrow that will um, contain the link as well. So we certainly thank you all for action and commitment and for um, you know, joining us tonight and you know, spending some time with us, uh, taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Um, again, I am Dr. Jessica Hare, the Empowerment Director for American Promise. And now I am going to turn it back over to Jeff Clements. Thank you, Dr. Jessica, and thanks to everyone for being here. Um, and uh, sign up at AmericanPromise.net. Uh, we will follow up um, with the link that uh, Jessica mentioned, uh, just so we can you can use that tool. It's in the chat now, but we'll be sending you an email tomorrow so you can pick it up and take this action. And then it's a lot more than one action, of course. We'll be working moving forward uh, with all of you, all of our partners on this call, and and many more. Uh, around the country. I want to thank Congressman Deutsch again, uh, Ben Jealous, Rob Weissman, Adam Smith, Jana Morgan for joining uh, the discussion tonight, and to all of you. We'll be back uh, next month uh, with more programming at American Promise. And until January, uh, I'm Jeff Clements, President of American Promise. Thank you again. Be safe, uh, take care, and we will see you soon.